housekeeping business. Uh, the CME code for today uh, is 76242. We'll put that in the chat. Uh, if you don't, if you haven't signed up for our system already, and I saw a few new users come through, you can uh, scan this um, QR code. It'll take you to a page and you can uh, sign in. It's free if you want to create a profile and they will keep a PDF log of your uh, CME. Next week, please join us. Dr. Bradley Lee, uh, who's at Hospital for Special Surgery, is going to be talking about cannabis and cannabinoid use in the perioperative period. Uh, if you haven't seen it, he had an excellent uh, review article in ANA last year, and we'll be walking through uh, those things. And I have to admit, um, uh, some of the practices I thought were correct <laughs> when I read the article weren't necessarily correct. And so um, that is, uh, I think it'll be a, a great time of learning. Anushka and I, who you will meet virtually today, um, are uh, running the meeting along with a couple other folks that will be here in Nashville in September. There's a QR code there that will also take you to um, the link for that at azerhq.org. Um, and uh, we'd love to have you here. We're going to have a phenomenal lineup of speakers and learning um, and a great time uh, with um, surgeons, anesthesiologists, CRNAs, nurses, nutritionists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so a, a big, it's a real fun interprofessional group. And that leads me to today, to introducing Dr. Anushka Afonso, who is not only a colleague, but a friend. Um, and uh, she is up at Sloan Kettering. Uh, she is an associate professor of anesthesiology at Sloan Kettering. Um, and uh, she is dual trained in both anesthesiology and internal medicine. Uh, her main areas of expertise are in both enhanced recovery and perioperative medicine. She's a leader at Sloan in um, perioperative, excuse me, in enhanced recovery, also in perioperative medicine, um, but she's the secretary and treasurer of uh, ACER um, or the American Society for Enhanced Recovery. We work together there, and she is the faculty uh, director of the MSK Pipeline Programs, and today she's going to be talking about the uh, Josie Robertson Surgery Center and really talking about, uh, if any of you follow Becker's one of the top headlines every day is what's going on with ambulatory surgery centers. And if you follow what's going on in payment, et cetera, we're looking at how do we stretch uh, what we do at ambulatory surgery centers. Um, and lots of folks here have been thinking about that. I see Raj Gupta on the call who runs Bell Mead and really thinking about what's the right criteria for cases and patients. And so uh, Dr. Afonso is gonna talk to us about that today. I'm really excited to talk to you today about cancer surgery in the outpatient setting and also share with you the genesis of our ambulatory center for cancer patients and some of the important concepts and lessons learned as we built our ambulatory center about six years ago. Um, these are my disclosures. Uh, I serve on the advisory board for a couple of things for Merck and as Matt mentioned, I am the secretary and the treasurer um, of ACER. So really quick, Memorial Sloan Kettering, it's in New York, founded 1884. It's one of the oldest cancer mm -hmm. hospitals. We just do cancer patients. It was actually on the Upper West Side, and then it moved to land that was donated by uh, John Rockefeller in, um, in 1936. So just to give you a historical background. Um, one thing that I thought was really interesting is in 1960, there was a partnership between Memorial Cancer Hospital and the Research Institute, and that they formalized this partnership into a single institution. So that's really important because as innovation happens, it's it's when we tie what happens at the bedside to the bench side um, with clinical care and vice versa. So where are we? We serve a lot of cancer patient populations in many different locations in Manhattan. I am based in Manhattan. I live very close by, a few blocks away actually from the hospital, so that makes my morning commute and evening commute very easy. We also serve our cancer patients in many locations outside of Manhattan, as you can see here. In terms of Manhattan, this is the map of the Upper East Side where I work and live. Space uh, is a very hot commodity, so we can't build out, so usually we build up. Before I get into some of the details of my talk, I'll really like to review some of the terminology so we're just all on the same page. Ambulatory is same day, day only. You come in the same day and you leave the same day. 
Ambulatory extended recovery or AXR, as I will refer to for um, during my talk, is a 23 hours. So you have one single overnight stay. And then short stay is 24 to 72 hours, which will not be the topic of my talk. Ambulatory surgery has grown in recent decades in volume and is continuing to grow. As you can see um, in this figure, there's a shift to more procedures being performed in an ambulatory surgical center and less surgery cases performed in the inpatient setting and hospital um, inpatient hospital departments. This is where we are. Um, what's circled right here is our ambulatory center. So you can see it's right next to it's on 61st Street. So it's right next to the 59th Street Bridge. This is another view of our ambulatory surgical center. And it's a really pretty building. But what makes it special is the humanity and the thought behind the building. One of the early challenges that our hospital had in terms of building an ambulatory surgical center for patients with cancer was that the case complexity. Um, needed, you know, you had to balance the case complexity and load, offload the cases that were done at the main hospital. So the complexity was a little bit higher than your typical ambulatory surgical center. Many of these patients are on a variety of chemotherapeutic drugs, um, went through radiation, poor nutritional status, et cetera, et cetera. So we really had to be thoughtful and think about the needs of the patient and the caregiver when we designed this center. So I really wanted to show you this slide, same slide, the main hospital. I just want you to be aware of that our freestanding ambulatory center is six blocks away from our main hospital. So what I'll refer to a little later on in terms of transfers, it's really a very short amb ambulance distance away. So what are some of the guiding questions when we think about the innovative approaches to patient care using modern principles for building and design, et cetera. Um, how can we become leaders in de delivering high quality and cost-effective ambulatory surgery? How can we maximally standardize processes and procedures? How do we continually assess progress to innovate and improve? And how can we apply new technology to streamline processes and I'll really allow the staff to focus on what matters, focus on the patients? What are some optimal roles for nurses and advanced care providers? And lastly, how can we ensure that the needs and experiences of the patient and their loved ones are considered and prioritized in everything we do? So our goal here was really our approach. Um, and our goal was we really wanted the same thing for our patients. The Ambulatory Center to focus on clinical quality and safety. We wanted it to have an unmatched patient experience designed for optimal patient experience and operational efficiency and leave room for innovation, collaboration, and continuous improvement. The Josie Robertson Surgical Center is part of MSK and operates as a hospital-associated outpatient clinic. Um, it's attached to the Memorial Hospital Ambulatory License and all the Josie Ambulatory staff are employees of MSK. As such, patients come to MSK for their cancer center, cancer care, and if surgery is indicated and the procedure and patient characteristics are appropriate, which I'll talk about, the surgery may be scheduled at the surgery center. It's staffed by a dedicated core team. So we have people that just work at Josie at the ambulatory center, but we also have nurses and surgeons and anesthesia providers, attending CRNAs that rotate from the main hospital to from the main hospital campus. The Josie Center in of itself employs about 450 employees, excluding physicians. So um, the surgery techs, the patient care techs, um, the pharmacists, we have a pathology lab, so path pathology technicians, physical therapists, and radiology technicians. So they're all part of this dedicated team here. So the support services are also key to making this place exist. We talked about the full surgical pathology lab that works very closely with the team. The, pa the pharmacies on site for outpatient uh, prescriptions. So patients don't have to go somewhere else after they're done with surgery. We, we're trying to make it easy for patients. Labs, you know, if we need additional labs, those are sent off site. Blood bank, basically a two to four units in-house for emergency release. So we only have O, o negative. Um, we rarely transfuse blood. 
and we rarely do cases that really need a large amount of transfusion. If that is the case, then we only have O negative. Um, what's really important is the surgical PAs. They're specialty trained. So for example, our plastic surgery cases, we have a very familiar team working with the surgeons of plastic surgery. So the same PAs are always working with the same surgeons. So they have the same diet, nocturnus. There is always a physician overnight in the hospital at all times, 24 seven. We have, we employ emergency medicine doctors who stay overnight um, after all the cases are done. So for our cases that require an overnight stay, a 23 hour stay, there's always someone. So um, they're staffed with anesthesia providers for, um, or emergency physicians for airway emergencies uh, or uh, anything, any other post-operative surgical or medical complications or any critical events that require immediate intervention or hospital transfer. Again, as I said before, our hospital transfer is six blocks away. Uh, we do consult teams um, from the ambulatory center. Um, cardiology and neurology are the most frequently consulted in, in the last six years of experience. So this is what our patient um, room looks like. Um, I'd really like to bring your attention to the fact that the nurse is not in an area far away from his or her patients in the nursing room. So the nurses, there's not a dedicated nurse's station that's far away. All the nurses stations are right in front of the patient's uh, rooms. And so the other thing I wanna mention is we do a lot of cross training of nurses. And that's really important, especially in this era of staffing shortages and the great resignation. So some of the nurses can function in a lot of different roles and we utilize them depending on the need. When I talk about the design, um, I'll show you why that's important as well. It really, right here, it's really designed and constructed for the sole purpose of surgical care. We don't have clinics, we don't have any other offices or any other patient services. They come here, just for their procedure, and then they go back home. Our volume is um, of patients is comprised of both outpatients, which is about 65% uh, of the volume, and ambulatory extended recovery, um, AXR, which is the remaining. Um, so those are very different where they're staying overnight, they recover, and um, they're discharged the next day. So they're usually there less than 23 hours. Of note, there are no licensed inpatient beds, so patients can only stay for one night postoperatively with an overall stay of 23 hours. So these are our stats. We have about 14 floors. We have 12 ORs that span three um, floors. So we're doing a lot of steps. I'm definitely getting my steps in when I'm working there. Um, we have 18 pre-op and post-op rooms and about 28 post-op recovery rooms. And then again, as I mentioned, these are our AXR, about 35% of our volume. And these are our mastectomies, thyroidectomies, hysterectomies, and prostatectomies. These robotic prostatectomies. Um, and we also do nephrectomies, robotic. And these are all gone the next day. This is what our waiting room looks like. Um, as you can see, it's very comfortable. There's a lot of areas for private seating arrangements. There's a whole, uh, on the same section, there's a whole surgical consultation room so the surgeon can meet with the family and caregiver. Um, there's Wi-Fi access, charging stations, cafe, gift shop. So it's very, it's a very clean, modern, functional design, very patient um, centric in terms of the design as well. Um, this is one of our best rooms. It's, it's uh, room number seven. So the patients are in there and, and you can see there's floor to ceiling windows and it allows for a lot of natural light and the city view, and that's the 59th Street Bridge in the background. Um, and the ones that are where the patients stay overnight, the AXR patients, um, we have private bathrooms and pull-out sleepers for the caregiver. Over 60% of overnight patients at our ambulatory center have a caregiver stay over, and that's important for a variety of reasons. Um, all our patient rooms are equipped with wall-mounted PACU level physiologic monitors, um, including those that the patient stay overnight. So the patient makes one stop post-op and that is cared for by a single cross-trained team throughout their recovery. Um, in addition, what's really important is some of the rooms 
actually all of the rooms have capabilities of video teleconferencing with patients postoperatively. So patients can contact their medical providers and doctors for any issues postoperatively. In fact, the morning after um, surgery, many surgeons use that telemedicine capability um, that's in every recovery room to check in with their patients right prior to discharge. And this is greatly appreciated and highly satisfying to the patients while at the same time, um, it's very convenient for surgeons who may have other responsibilities somewhere else that prohibit them from coming into the surgery center. So we're trying to reduce any type of barrier between the patients and the care team to allow for engagement and have everyone engaged and informed while at the same time allowing for a very timely discharge. So this is the design of our floors and it's really, um, as you can see between each patient, there's a nurse cubicle or a workstation. So there's no, as I mentioned before, there's no nursing station. They're, they're literally right in front of the patients. So if there's any issue, the nurses are there. In the yellow, you can see this is the walkway and it's really designed for efficient workflow and promote active recovery. So we have a centralized unit right here, which is our oasis. It's a very living room type hall. So the patients and caregivers can congregate, relax in that area. They're encouraged to ambulate in the figure eight <clears throat> shaped pathway here around the oasis. So that's also in very close proximity to um, the nursing staff. So again, here, this is what this looks like, this oasis and the, you know, the, the patients are walking in a figure eight manner where they can get their steps in after surgery and promote active recovery. So technology can be very exciting and one can get carried away with the choices at times, um, but just like design, there has to be some humanity behind the technology. Otherwise, it doesn't really help the clinical team or the patients. An important design element was the use of technology to basically promote patient flow, communication, data collection, supply chain, um, documentation, and such. Um, others were implementations that were used across MSK, such as the EMR and communication systems. These were customized and integrated uh, while we built the, bu the building. So it was integrated and embedded into the building. Um, a few different technologies were hardwired during the construction, such as the RTLS, real-time locating system, nursing call system, and bedside hemodynamic monitors. For the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on the RTLS. So this is our RTLS system. So it's a device that basically allows you to know where you're at, to know where your patients are at, know where your colleagues are at. And... Um, it allows for time stamping, patient flow, staff management, and it interacts with the EPIC boards and gives allows you to give a get really good high level summary boards of what's happening with clinical flow. And interestingly enough, during um, COVID, this re real time locating system had an unanticipated use for contact tracing purposes. So people would look in and see if you know, any individuals were in the same room for 15 minutes and they were, con if someone was positive, they were all contacted for appropriate quarantine measures. So this is um, just automated visibility for fast room turnover. So this functions like a stoplight with color coding, rooms red to stop, dirty, green to go, it's clean. It helps for efficiency workflow. It alerts the cleaning staff in real time. As soon as a patient leaves the OR, they're cleaning. Um, and these minutes matter, especially when you're in a busy surgical center like ourselves. So this is one way in terms of in terms of room turnover. It also allows you to know. Sorry, right here you can see who's in which which room. If it's an anesthesiologist, if it's a surgeon, a patient, etc. So basically, um, these are the surgeons. You can also observe OR workflow in real time. So um, it also serves in terms of how much they ambulated after surgery, the distance ambulated, if they're on this pathway for recovery and what's left pending. So you can really see distance ambulated and if the pathway is progressing or if they're falling off the pathway, that will also alerts the clinical team to what needs to happen next. Uh, this is an example of um, the, the status board. So this is in the waiting room. So this communicates 
you know, the patient flow to the relative waiting in the waiting room. We have coded identifiers only given to the caregiver so they can see real time updates on the status board. So this helps create a serene atmosphere, especially for those anxiously waiting for their important information about their loved one's cancer surgery. So it also shows you when the staff enters a room, um, their name is displayed in the patient room and allows for a better communication that way. So I talked to you about the building and some key aspects of design and workflow. So how did we decide which patients are selected to go there? As an outpatient cancer surgery center, it was initially proposed in 2010 when we had a growth in surgical case volume, and that was projected to outstrip the OR capacity at the main campus. So, um, you know, within a decade. So this increasingly high inpatient census dominated by patients undergoing more and more complex medical treatment. So that's how we decided of this idea of a short stay ambulatory center. Basically freeing up beds made this very, very appealing. What was really important is, hold on one second. Um, we really had to identify the type of surgical procedures with a suitable patient selection and management that can be discharged home after a single overnight stay. A team was uh, arranged to create a plan to um, figure this out. So what they did was really try and streamline a couple procedures and ca patient characteristics and testing it out at the main hospital and um, really you know, discerning who's an outpatient versus who's an AXR, an ambulatory extended recovery, the one single overnight stay that I talked about. Five years prior to it debuting, um, we really had published some of the results and basically they tested the safety and efficacy of a clinical pathway with certain procedures here, in this case, minimally invasive prostatectomy. And an emphasis was placed on pre-op teaching and education with printed online and is that me or is a uh, printed online instruction with web-based interactive classes um, with minimally invasive, you know, robotic prostatectomies. Um, the Foley care and management was an issue, so they did additional um, teachings with that. So they really looked at surgery specific issues that, you know, and barriers to an early discharge and focused in on that. So this was published. And um, what was interesting is the fact that you know, the proportion of patients that stayed longer than one night was 53 in 53% in the year before they initiated this AXR program. And after they initiated this with the clinical care pathway and teaching and uh, education, um, the rates were about 8% who stayed longer after they initiated the pathway. And this was streamlined at the main hospital. Okay, so we knew that this was feasible, this was possible, and this was safe. So that's where we get into some of um, our publications over the last few years, really describe the genesis of this ambulatory center, the care model, the outcome tracking, quality improvement efforts for select procedures undergoing these relatively complex procedures in the ambulatory setting. So um, when we talk about patient selection, you know, initially we defined when we first started this about six years ago, we defined exclusion criteria based on literature and criteria clinical concern. You know, if all those patients, you know, we probably excluded a lot of them when we began. Then we continued to reassess our standards. We, as we got more comfortable, those exclusions were liberalized to flags for individual evaluation because we looked at our data and we showed that some of these previously defined exclusion criteria and patient outcomes, they weren't really impacted. What do we do now? Well, the criteria are flags for individual evaluation. We focus on functional capacity, the current condition of the patient. We assess these patients very early to determine the appropriate location, if it's the ambulatory center or six blocks away. Uh, and we really look at a collaborative approach. So we identify it, anesthesia is involved, surgery is involved, um, and we take into account the case complexity, the patient comorbidity, and clinical judgment. So 
what we had done before, um, we kind of just use this as flags now and not a hard stop rule that X amount of patients were not allowed uh, to, to have surgeries in our surgery center. Standardized pathways, care management. Um, again, our approach is really patient care's end-to-end -end management. From the moment the decision is made for them to have surgery in the surgery's office, pre-op eval, the education processes, expectation processes, um, and such. And so, you know, when we look and focus really on what happens in terms of the anesthesia aspect of perioperative care and how we apply enhanced recovery pathways and processes in this care, we already know that these add value. And we try to um, input some of these equations pre-op, intra-op, post-op. But the important point, the important point here is the fact that these programs don't necessarily equate to an order set. ERPs, enhanced recovery programs, are, are dynamic. They're not static. So we continually change and revise based on the data and feedback that we're getting from um, our, our TLS, our EPIC, our workflow, and our data um, assessment. So these are some of our AXR type cases that we're doing over and outpatient cases that we're doing over at the surgery center. And we recently added in um, breast flaps and trying to discharge them within 23 hours. We've added in a couple other um, type of procedures as well. But this is a, this gives an overview of what type of procedures that we are doing at our outpatient and our AXR. Um, we have about 15 attendings on the regional block team. So we do preemptive analgesia for select procedures in the pre-op room before the patient even comes into the OR. So we have people who come in the morning, the nurses are trained, we have a whole team that you know, knows who the patients are, can sense them, um, you know, and we do blocks on about over 700 to 800 patients a year, uh, primarily chest wall blocks for our breast cancer surgeries, prior vertebrals, serratus, pecs. Uh, we have a dedicated team that does that. We also do QL blocks for minimally invasive nephrectomies. We have a study on that right now. But that's a workflow that worked best for our patients and staff. You may have a different workflow that will work better in your hospital depending on your space and your staffing. Either way, it's important to communicate with the surgical team um, prior to doing all these different types of blocks where their actual anticipated surgical incision is. Plan for a preemptive analgesic option and make sure all your surgeons are on the same page and aware. POV is a very big deal in our ambulatory um, in, in ambulatory patients and that can be a barrier in terms of discharge planning. So you know I don't expect all of you guys to look at our BARF pathway, our best antiemetic relief flow pathway, but you also have to keep in mind that a lot of our patients are on chemotherapeutic drugs. And so we have to be mindful and a little bit more proactive about that. So we developed this risk stratification to, you know, based on AFL, based on other experiences, and really we have it integrated into our electronic, um, in electronic medical records so it can guide anesthesia care in terms of type of anesthetic. Um, these tools are utilized by the nursing staff, communicated to the patient in terms of post-discharge. The important point is that every aspect of care towards our ambulatory patient here is standardized. So we have enhanced recovery programs um, as part of this multidisciplinary care. And, you know, we originally developed it for inpatients, as you know, uh, but certain elements would really apply very well to the ambulatory setting. And as such, we've really incorporated that since our patients leave the next day. Changing gears, I'm really going to touch upon some communication and show you how the technology has facilitated, facilitated care and feedback. Um, from our patients. Stress in terms of our web-based education modules and um, education in terms of preoperatively and verbal and text messaging. So we do a lot of that already at the surgery center. This is just an example of a recovery progress plan that the patients are given prior and also when they are in the hospital so they know what their goals are at every step of the way to facilitate recovery. Post-discharge engagement is probably the most overlooked opportunity to ensure a successful ambulatory surgery experience for patients, particularly in um, the more complex surgeries. So 
when possible, we have the dis the caregiver involved in the discharge care. In fact, even after they go home, they have what I've shown here, which is the recovery tracker that captures patient symptom reporting. That's part of our routine care at our ambulatory center. So this is a unique feature of post discharge support for our ambulatory center. Um, you can see here it uh, talks about you. Know, we have 18 symptom questions, eight symptom areas. And two questions really assessing if they need urgent care or a doctor right away. Um, we've published this. This is some of our pain, pain trajectories upon discharge, and these are based on six years and thousands and thousands of patients' experience in terms of what their patient reported severity is. So if the patient says, Hey, I'm having um, you know, really pain, my pain level is X amount, we can say, well, that's kind of in line with patients you know, who are having similar surgeries and that caught, you know, that that, you know, gives a little peace of mind to the patient and the surgeon in terms of that aspect of things as well. So we do have an idea of patterns of pain uh, severity after procedures and uh, um, and also alerts the team in terms of if a patient is above the threshold. So during business hours, uh, patients are contacted for follow up alerts. So if it's after hours, the on call coverage will respond to any alerts that exceed the preset thresholds of, um, you know, yellow or the red level. This was a study that was done where they randomized uh, almost 3000 patients to stand of care or to the enhanced recovery tracker feedback. Um, the primary study outcome was urgent care visits without readmission within 30 days. And secondary outcomes were patient anxiety and nursing utilization. So we didn't see any effects on readmissions, but providing patients with feedback about their symptoms really um, had an effect in terms of reducing their anxiety and the nursing workload without really affecting readmissions. So this really kind of gave some signal and you know tried to support a wider incorporation of some kind of normative feedback in systems for routine uh, patient reported out. Uh, another paper in JAMA from our group um, showed in a large number of patients, around 7,000, that electronic patient reported symptom tracking had a decreased odds of patient in readmission or in urgent care. The impact of this um, recovery tracker were that it potentially avoided about 40% of urgent care visits in, in terms of our post, again, this was retrospective. But um, this low risk and high benefit of this intervention, again, suggested that this could be implemented um, a little bit more often. These are uh, study results from that. Another aspect of things is, you know, we have a lot of continuous improvement projects, but I'm gonna highlight the opioid story a bit in the next few slides. Um, Overprescribing of opioids during, after surgery contributes to some long-term abuse. This paper from our group really evaluated the opioid prescription patterns and narcotic usage to identify potential overprescription. So, you know, in the past, they were, you know, the different services, GYN, urology, breast, they were just giving everyone about 20 pills. And so when we looked at really what's what's being utilized, contacting patients, looking at refills, et cetera, um, we really found that we could really reduce that to a man, almost, you know, almost half of that. So um, we did that and that was safely reduced without any any issues or any issues in terms of on their subsequent opioid use or their reported pain. Another study that looked at is really changing the default. So um, when routinely prescribed opioids for pain control, this was usually under some breast surgeries. Um, this is specifically lumpectomy and sentinel node. Um, the hypothesis is patients could be discharged without opioids. And um, it, the study basically examined outcomes after changing the standard discharge prescription from an opioid NSAID um, to just an NSAID acetaminophen. And you can see, there was a 78% reduction in opioid prescriptions with no difference in patient reported pain scores. So we changed our default there. Another study that looked specifically at the pain population, um, at the, sorry, the breast population is um, acute post-op pain. So acute post-op pain really affects time to opioid cessation and quality of life. 
and is associated with chronic pain. So the study, the, the team here developed a normogram <clears throat> to potentially identify, you know, high risk patients for moderate to severe pain following a mastectomy. So they collected variables on almost, you know, a little over a thousand patients over a year. And they examined the pain severities on post op day one to five with moderate severe pain as the outcome of interest. And they looked at, um, you know, multivariable logistic regression to, perf to identify variables associated with uh, moderate to severe pain in a cohort about almost close to a thousand patients. So what did they find? They found that high BMI, preoperative stress, uh, distress thermometer score greater than or equal to four, and bilateral surgery predicted moderate to severe pain. You know, these type of risk stratifications, especially in a busy surgical a surgery center, and you want these patients, we, we do a very high volume of breast cases, we want these patients to go home, but we also want to make sure we individually tailor their perioperative pain management and early post-op interventions that can treat pain and also assist with some opioid tapering. So this is our study where we looked at, you know, earlier on, we're six years in, so um, this is about three years since implementation. So uh, what I did was with the group was just looking at some of the enhanced recovery pathways and protocols and outcomes in our ambulatory surgical oncology center published about a couple of years ago. And as you can see here, these are some of the key components of ERAS here. And we talked about a few of that. And in the interest of time, um, you know, this is just an overview of what we've done and what we've looked at in terms of from the pre-op, um, intra-op setting, and post-op setting. And you can refer to this paper. But for each ERAS service line, an electronic order set was created to initiate that everything was standardized. And again, you know, there's certain considerations. Um, for example, in our breast uh, consideration, we have a pre-op nerve blocks. We um, mastectomy patients having immediate re reconstruction are, are offered pre-op nerve blocks. We have a big study right now deciding which nerve block is the best. And we found that lorazepam postoperatively, uh, a lot of these patients were having chest wall tightness, which was very distinct from surgical pain. So we felt that that helped as well. Um, in terms of for our thyroidectomies, we use smaller tubes to minimize that laryngeal edema. We, you know, we use basically six for the most part. And to re reduce PONV, we have dexamethasone eight intraoperatively instead of the usual four. We spray lidocaine down the endotracheal tube before uh, surgical closure, closure. And we also give benzocaine lozenges in the PACU as well. And for our prostatectomies, um, we really restrict fluids until from um, fluid administration is restricted from surgical incision to bladder closure to facilitate visualization and minimize airway and facial edema from that steep Trendelenburg positioning. Um, at that point, fluid deficits are then replenished after the, the um, closure is then done of up to two liters. So we retrospectively analyzed almost 7,000 cases that were done in the first three years. Um, these are the, the, the mix of what we looked at. And I'm just going to show you a few trends over the last three years. Again, it's changed because this was three years ago. Um, but in terms of mastectomy, we've increased our, oops, We've increased our TIVA use over the last three years. Um, our PONV rescue medications have gone down. We've used less narcotics, uh, less time to, you know, getting their first dose um, of oral and opioids, and our total MMEs um, have gone down. And that really has also, um, you know, also happened with the increased use of our um, our preoperative blocks that happen before the patient comes into the OR. Um, we have compliance, and this is from almost 3,000 cases of what we're doing. And um, and I want you to note that this, this is what it looks like in real life. It's not perfect. It's dynamic. It's always changing. But it's important for us to look at these rates to really see if what we're doing is really what we're intending in this whole process. So this is the this is again the first three years. Um, 
overall in our ambulatory center, we see nausea was a big problem. Initially, we steadily increased our use of TIVA. Um, our PONV rescue meds went down. And, um, you know, we really are alerting our staffing and using the BARF algorithm to reduce our, no, uh, our um, nausea even more so. Again, pain, um, oops, getting back. You know, this is again, the first three years, it's much better now but they transitioned, we use less, and some didn't even get any um, narcotics in the PACU. Again, some of them have other issues as well um, related to their cancers that require some pain control. We have a lot of chronic pain patients as well. Um, again, I had talked to you about the real-time locating system. Mobility and ambulation uh, really encouraged by the PACU the nursing staff with specific instructions to complete those laps in the figure eight. So they're encouraged to ambulate within a few hours uh, postoperatively and discharge when they meet the discharge criteria. So um, a metric for this outcome is the actual steps that they're ambulating. And this makes it a little bit less subjective than mere observation. So we can actually quantify, as I mentioned before, um, the distances before they were discharged. In fact, in the study, we report median time to first ambulation was about five to six hours. And this is after robotic prostatectomies, nephrectomies, mastectomies, thyroidectomies, especially in those overnight stays. So success really depends on patient's functional recovery, early ambulation, which we're encouraging as it reduces pulmonary complications and thrombotic events, especially important in cancer patients. Um, and these are some of our compliances. So we track, we uh, we have an attention to detail, we have a team here, and sometimes we have to change our pathways to react to the data or um, your shortages with, you know, the, the dreaded supply chain shortages. Um, and again, emphasizing that this is dynamic. Overall, our compliance is high, but it varies with um, surgical procedures. So this is the data from where, um, from our publication about three years ago. Um, as you can see here, our readmission rates and urgent care visits and transfer rates are pretty low, and so is our uh, reoperation rates. Um, another aspect of things that I just want to be mindful of time is uh, we have, as you know, a very high number of overweight and obese patients presenting for ambulatory surgery. And here we basically reported outcomes comparing almost 14,000 patients at our main hospital with about almost 5,000 patients at our freestanding surgical center. And we looked at everything from length of stay, readmissions, and tried to figure out was BMI um, really associated with um, decision-making to do it or not to do it at the surgery center? And was it really associated with the higher degree of transfers or not? And what we found were that, you know, those with a higher BMI, you know, 50 and above, did have a higher rate of transfer out, um, but the difference in rate was so small. The mean risk was 0.8% for BMI of 25 versus 1.3% for BMI of 40. So although it was uh, statistically significant, we didn't clinically really, we didn't find any evidence with our higher BMIs that we have been doing over at our ambulatory center in terms of urgent care visits or readmissions, you know, even now using six years of data. So again, as I mentioned, in terms of patient selection, we really look at both the patient and the procedure to determine eligibility. How about sleep apnea? So um, what's important with our surgery center is all patients have to be screened within one month of the date of surgery. And if they are diagnosed, they are asked to bring in their own CPAP machine. So usually they use their own CPAP machine, um, you know, postoperatively. And um, in terms of data, we have um, this is this is from our um, our data. We have almost six thousand patients included. About ten percent were diagnosed with moderate high risk OSA, and they did have some higher. We do have a respiratory therapist in house, by the way, but they do have a little bit of higher frequency of post op respiratory events. But um, it wasn't anything that warranted. Um, severe intervention. There was no increased rate of urgent care visits after or readmissions in multivariable analysis within 30 days. 
So what are some ongoing projects that we're looking at? You know, you know, which block is the best for mastectomy patients looking specifically at ambulation? We have same day discharges for mastectomy versus recon patients if those patients are done early in the morning. And we're continuously trying to figure out um, in terms of PONV pro prophylaxis, can we do better? Um, and we're looking at select flap patients that can be offloaded to the ambulatory center in the 23 hour setting. And we we're always trying to see which multimodal is the best and how can we fine tune some of those. So here are our volumes and outcomes. Um, we've done almost close to 50,000 cases. Uh, we have that experience and these are urgent care visits within 30 days. This is compiling everyone about 4% readmissions within 30 days, about 2%. Um, those that were not AXR that were not a planned AXR staying overnight and came in as an outpatient but stayed overnight were about 3.5%. But some of them just wanted to stay there overnight. It was a really nice environment. They have beautiful floor to ceiling windows. They have a nice private bathroom. Some of them just really wanted to stay there overnight and didn't have anyone to pick them up. Um, and you know, our adverse surgical adverse event rate was less than 3%. So these, this is our data and this is, you know, our outpatients again, as I mentioned before, comprise about 65% of volume, our AXR 16,560 and our robotic assisted we're doing almost 7,000. So in terms of reasons for transfers, these are our reasons, um, in terms of the data from, um, our different, um, our different surgical services. So bleeding hematoma, the breast hematoma is the most common reason for transfers, especially if it's done after all the ORs are closed. You know, if there's a hematoma that comes up and there's no one available, we transfer them six blocks away to main campus to do it by the on-call service. Um, and these are the different locations. Um, we sometimes transfer them over to Cornell in terms of if there's a stroke or something like that. And lastly, you know, um, there is a big push in terms of at our surgery center to focus on the patients and the staff. We're patient centered from the moment the patient enters the facility to after they leave their facility and above. We've had awards <clears throat> from the Press Ganey score. This is our front entrance. <clears throat> so a very big part of why this place runs the way it does is because of the staff. And specifically, we have a whole division that's centered around staff programming, initiatives, and culture. And you can see a couple of the things that we do to really, um, you know, keep burnout at bay as much as possible. Um, but we find that staff engagement and happiness is really essential to keeping this place run as much as it does. A lot of mentorship, shadowing. Um, we have. Um, multicultural potlucks. We have uh, fairs just at Josie, um, poster fairs, uh, research fairs, and pillar and recognition, uh, you know, recognizing people and, and showing, you know, really having their value uh, being recognized by all is important and really creates a really nice atmosphere. So key points really, uh, I'm showing you what way, I'm showing you the same slide that I started out with and just, just showing you that our our approach is the same thing. We want the same thing for our patients. Uh, the key point here is complex cancer surgery can be done in an ambulatory surgical center in a safe manner. We have close to 50,000 patients to show you that it can, but for safe and high quality patient care and operation, operational efficiency, we can't be rigid all the time. We have to constantly evolve, collaborate, and allow for continuous improvement. So this is our Josie team, uh, Dr. Takita, Dr. Ladone, and Bev, and we have so many more uh, in terms of making this happen. Um, thank you for your time. My contact information is at the bottom if you wish to reach me. If I don't have the answer to your question right now, I'll inquire and get back to you, but feel free to um, reach me at the bottom as well. Thank you. Awesome. Boy, thank you so much. Um, I'm hearing some, uh, I'm, I'm seeing questions come through the chat, so I'm seeing lots of uh, claps that you're getting. Uh, people have been texting me during this which and saying, hey, how does she do that? And what's going on? So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be quiet now because I always ask too many questions. Um, 
I know I saw, I think Debbie Smith had a question. Kim Rangel, I know, had a question. Um, so there's Dr. Rangel, I just saw. Um, so I'm going to be quiet and let people start to fire away and spend the next uh, few minutes until five uh, peppering you with questions. Thank you, Anushka. You're welcome. Thanks for the invitation. Um, hi. Oh, hey. Hi. Thank you so much for this um, amazing talk that it's really astonishing to see all that you have accomplished. Um, oh, it's definitely not me. I'm part of a big team and Josie, they have a lot of people there to support. And I think that's that's key. I think having a big team that has the same interest at heart. Totally makes sense. And it's uh, it's an incredible endeavor. Um, the one question I had is about um, the alert system that you have with the um, the post operative alert system that pages you at a certain threshold is that and you said it was through their my health so is that an epic based platform or is that a different platform that feeds back how did, how are you it's able a to different platform and honestly they it goes back to the surgery staff and the the you know the the PAs and they get that alert from the team so i'll find out more information i can send that on to you but it's definitely not epic completely because we're still trying to get Epic here. <laughs> we have it. So it's on a different system and I can send you if you just uh, send me an email and I'll reply yeah. back to you with the paper that we published it in and also um, put you in touch with someone who um, has more information about the exact mechanism and, and how to get that flow. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Let me look at the chat. Sorry. I'm yeah, there's one question that. about basically, I think you expanded the criteria so much. Someone said, do you have any hard no's <laughs> to uh, sounds like if someone's on ECMO, um, you won't so, do ambulatory surgery. On yeah, it. honestly, I feel like I've done awake fiber optics in my ambulatory center. <laughs> you know, um, I do I have a hard do we have a hard no? Honestly, these criteria are just flags. We do have. Um, you know, pacemaker dependent that needs reprogramming is a hard no. You know, we rarely do ASA fours, but our ASA four may be, you know, a lot of things going on. Um, you know, we have done critical aortic stenosis, but again, you've got to you've got to group together the patient and the procedure. I've done critical aortic stenosis on a lumpectomy. We have to kind of look, you know, in terms of clinical judgment. We, we use the criteria before to flag them, and then we individually look at the support system, who, who the patient has when they go back home, who, you know, what support systems, how preoperatively optimized they are, where they are in their, their healthcare. So we really individualize that. One other question, or maybe two other questions. Did you have any major problems with the surgeons? I lost you. Problems with the surgeons question is in the chat actually she asked um, if there were any problems with the patients choosing the style of patient for the surgery center or or how did you sort of work with the surgery team I think to pick the the type of patient type of surgery so this uh, was all done before I came along this was done for years and years and years over at Song uh, at the main hospital so they trialed out um, we started with uh, minimally invasive prost robotic prostatectomies. They trialed it out at the main hospital. And honestly, when you're building a new center, it's much easier to get buy-in and how things are going to be done when you're starting fresh, right? Um, I found as the head of enhanced recovery after, per uh, after surgery in the hospital here that it's much easier to do the ERAS and get everyone on the same page at a new center, building it from scratch than trying to change people here when you have ongoing procedures that have already been done a certain way. So um, I think everyone had that buy-in already going there. These are the types of procedures we're going to do. This is our experience with it. We've published on it. We've also had our own internal data that that showed that it could be safe, it's feasible, and we could get them out uh, with, with uh, you know, decreased rate of readmissions, a return to urgent care, et cetera. So that was, that was um, we were successful in that aspect of things. Um, when patients come up, you know, we talk to the, you know, in terms of flagging criteria, we use those initially as flags and 
we, you know, there's always a conversation between the surgery team and the anesthesia, the head of surgery, the head of anesthesia at the department. And it's, it's really, we have to, as I mentioned before, just look at the whole patient before deciding what the best location for the patient would be. Hey, Anushka, this is Raj Gupta. Um, so just to, hey, Raj. Uh, I, I think to clarify uh, Debbie's question and then add my own question on top of that is, uh, the question becomes is, are the surgeons good at self-screening? Um, and then the first time that uh, anesthesia sees a patient is on the day of surgery, or is anesthesia the screening process? Um, where does that fit into the workflow? And the, the second part of my question is, is that obviously what you got here is almost pushing a mini hospital. Um, you guys have a lot of support and infrastructure to push the envelope. You're, you're approaching, it's, it's a fine line between a hospital and, and an ambulatory center. Um, what are the key elements in that infrastructure or workflow that gives you the courage to do the more complex cases? If you were to kind of reflect back, what are the elements that say, okay, I'm going to be more bold, or if I didn't have this, I would be more conservative? I think I just saw something in the chat. I'll answer one question at a time. So I think uh, we we do have central lines, A lines. Um, we have O negative blood, you know, a few units. Our staff is not, I mean, we have some select uh, staff that just does the ambulatory, but our staff rotates from Maine to Josie. So we have very good cross training of uh, staff and different capabilities of what they can do. And I think that's helped. Um, I think also the fact that, I mean, I showed you the data, we have less than a 3%, um, you know, transfer rate out. Um, even though it's six blocks away, there is something about, hey, the main hospital is six blocks away. So that does give you a little bit of, um, you know, security. But we haven't transferred as many, given the volume, we have almost, you know, 50,000. We haven't transferred as many because we have some safeguards in play. And we also have learned from our first couple of years of experience uh, in terms of what works with the workflow um, and are the capabilities of the staff that that are there. Um, as far as who sees the patient, we have a, a pre-surgical testing and uh, the anesthesiologist, Dr. Weiss, Weiss is head of that in terms of pre-op clinic. So, you know, we have patients doing um, either telemedicine visits and some who are just very the basic, we don't have them come and see. So, but if the surgeons feel when they come into clinic to see them that they need additional testing or they need something else, they go to our anesthesia run I think you had one more question, but I can't remember it. <laughs> yeah, the, the main question I asked you was about uh, what are the key elements in your infrastructure or workflow that you feel like allow you to be more aggressive? I mean, part of it is when we compare it to other ambulatory centers, that's let's say four operating rooms, they're obviously not going to be able to do the level of um, co-management with you know, a pharmacy, blood product availability, arterial line, you know, you can't do all of those things. So it changes the mix of surgeries. So how do you scale that to smaller centers and what are the key elements that make it possible? I think the main thing is, um, you know, for example, you know, our pain management in terms of requiring, you know, really good pain management before they leave the hospital. A lot of them, especially in the ambulatory world, um, reasons for delayed discharge is PONV and, and, and pain. So knowing that, we really try to emphasize um, the pain management aspect of things. So we've been very aggressive with having team, you know, our regional block team to come in um, and really figure out what we can do to optimize the pain and the level of pain for a safe discharge and a timely discharge um, to some of the hospital, to, to going back home. I think that's been a big, um, big, big help. Um, our workflow is as such where we try and do some of these preemptive blocks before they get into um, get into the surgery. Um, we reevaluate them after in terms of do they need rescue blocks? Do they? Um, and we have a whole system in place for that in terms of addressing both their PONB and their pain because those, you know, even at a regular. Um, ambulatory center, those are still the two reasons for delayed discharge um, from that. I think the lessons learned is um, knowing who to call when and availability of staff. Um, you know, 
especially in the era of staffing shortages, and we always have uh, a who to call and emergency management uh, manuals that are in place in case things happen. Um, a stroke protocol, um, an post-op MI protocol, a uh, corneal abrasion protocol, um, and I think those have, you know, we these are from lessons learned in the first couple of years. Um, having these protocols in place and educating the staff has been you know, paramount. So those are the couple, Raj, that I think um, are important and that would be applicable. Whatever ambulatory center or wh wherever you start off with having those emergency guides of how to manuals for the whole staff and making sure that everyone's engaged and knows what to do. Well, I know that we crossed over the 5 p.m. threshold and uh, Matt had to run off to the OR. Are there any last minute questions that folks have coming in? Well, thank you again so much for taking the time to share um, this information um, about this effort with us. It's, it's really remarkable um, and I think we all have a lot to learn and we appreciate um, all of our uh, wide variety of guests for joining us um, for this week's series. Um, and we hope to see you back again for the next one. Um, and, and thank you. Thank you so much. And again, my email is afonsoa at mskcc.org. So if there are any questions that I didn't answer, please feel free to um, email me. Thank you again.